morning, everyone. Students, colleagues, honored guests. I'd like to tell you a story this morning about my dad's dad. He died when I was 10 years old in 1979. For many years, he worked as a high school counselor in Cholac in the Fraser Valley. Before that, he taught chemistry, and he also taught at a school here in Swinemont. But before that, and soon after he and my granny arrived in Canada from the UK, he taught high school chemistry in southern Saskatchewan. And that's where he was when the German army invaded Poland and the Second World War began. Many of my granddad's former students volunteered to fight in the war. I don't remember hearing my granddad talk about it, but the family story goes that some of those young men volunteered partly because they and their families knew that my granddad would be leading them, and they were reassured to some degree because they thought he would be able to keep an eye out for them. He trained them, and he trained with them before they left for England. And then one morning before dawn, after months of training, they crossed the English Channel to attack German-occupied France. They landed just outside a town called Dieppe. Some of you will have heard about Dieppe. Books have been written about it, about the rain on Dieppe, the mistakes that were made, and why the rain happened at all. All accounts agree it was a bloodbath. German machine guns were mounted in the cliffs overlooking the beaches the Canadian, British, and American soldiers landed on. And in just a few hours, it was over. Almost 60% of the 6,086 soldiers who made it ashore were killed, wounded, or captured. After the war, my granddad was awarded something called the Distinguished Service Order because, and, and here I'm quoting the officer who presented the medal to him, quote, of all the commanders among the Canadian forces at Dieppe, August 19th, 1942, he was the only one who captured and held the position he was ordered to occupy. He countered the enemy counterattacks until he was ordered to withdraw and successfully withdrew against strong opposition, enabling the majority of his company to enter the landing craft. Then, with a small group, he remounted the cliffs above the town in order to interfere with the strong enemy fire, which was causing heavy casualties among the troops entering the landing craft. Inflicting casualties in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the advancing enemy, which vastly outnumbered his patrol, they withdrew to the beach once more. So, in student and teacher speak, he got an A+. Plus. But the landing craft were already full to overflowing, and in fact, many of those landing craft capsized full of soldiers, killing all the board. Major Orm remained behind and was taken prisoner. He survived in a prisoner of war camp for three years. And 20 years later, he stood in front of the students at his school and remembered the state assembly much like this one. And at that school, he started by saying, Tomorrow is Remembrance Day, a modern, holy day. 
Remembrance Day is set apart to remember a loved one, a relative, a friend, a comrade, who made the supreme sacrifice in the service of their country. You might have read about some of these events in your books, or seen them depicted in the films, or you may have heard from grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles. You may have heard about the thousands who were killed in major wars, but these statistics can be awfully hard to relate to. For most of us, living in a country involved in a major war with blackouts, food rationing, air raids, and the constant threat of sudden death is, fortunately, outside our experience. Fifty years ago, when my granddad spoke, it had been a long time since the First World War. But he remembered it quite well, because he was your age when it started. And he thought of that age as the age at which you will remember more than at any other time in your lives. When the First World War began, he was a student just starting high school and too young to fight. By the time the war ended, many of the older students at his school who had been able to fight had been killed or were crippled. At the end of the First World War, on that first armistice day, as it was then called, my granddad was a first-year university student in London, England, and he remembered feeling as though he was at the center of the universe. His oldest brother had survived two and a half years of what he called the muddy bloodbath of war-torn Flanders. His other brother, 19 years old, had by then been missing in action for several months. The war had been over for three weeks when my granddad heard that a trainload of prisoners of war was due to arrive at Waterloo Station in London. And he found his missing brother, fortunately, still alive. It's hard for us to imagine how the losses of the First World War affected his generation. But my granddad's memories of how the city of London observed that first armistice day hints at how deeply the war affected everyone. He remembered, for the first time, a nation stood silent for two minutes and remembered its war dead. The vast city of London stopped. The steady roar of the traffic ceased. Buses stopped. Taxis, cars, trams stopped in their tracks. The trains underground stopped in their tears. Complete and absolute silence reigned as the nation remembered. Twenty years after the end of the First World War, my granddad, who was then teaching, felt that many had forgotten the horrors of the war. When he spoke to his students, he remembered, men were preaching hate again. And he said, so I found myself in an armistice day parade, this time with a company of men behind me. My men, many of them I had taught in school, ready to follow me in battle for what we thought was right. I remember the orders that had to be given, and the enthusiasm and loyalty with which they were carried out. Many did not return. Then he remembered being a prisoner. After three years of captivity, of frustration, subsistence living conditions, and semi-starvation, 
after accidentally being shot at by our own planes as we marched out to safety in freedom. I was finally back in London for another Armistice Day. They called it VE Day this time for Victory in Europe. Then it was August, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki had disappeared with the opening of a new atomic age. It was VJ Day, and the war was over. Or was it? Is it? My granddad wanted to make sure that we don't forget. He told his students, you cannot forget. You never do. We who do know must try to tell you. 